last week we talked about the, the kingdom principles of compassion and faith and action and persistence. Uh, please go back and check those out and watch those messages first if you haven't. One day Jesus was, was teaching in a home and the Pharisees and the religious leaders were sitting all around him. They had come from nearly every village in Galilee and in Judea, even as far away as Jerusalem to be with Jesus. So this, this place is a packed out home. Then some men arrived carrying a, a paraplegic man on a stretcher. They, they looked for a way to get into the house and, 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 and to set him before Jesus. And when they couldn't find a way in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof. They removed some of it and, and led him down in the middle of everyone, right in front of Jesus. Man, this is almost comical if you can imagine this. These guys were radical. Anyways, impressed by their bold belief, Jesus says, Friend, I forgive your sins. Now that set the religious scholars and Pharisees buzzing. Who does he think he is? That's blasphemous talk. God and only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew exactly what they were thinking. So he said this. Well, just so it's clear that, the son of man, that, I, that I'm the son of man and that I'm authorized to do this, he now spoke directly to the paraplegic. And he said, get up, take up your bedroll, without, and go home. And without a moment's hesitation, he did that. He got up, he took his blanket, and he left for home, giving glory to God all the way. Now the people, they, they rubbed their eyes incredulous, and, and then they also gave glory to God, awestruck. They've said, they said, we've never seen anything like that. Man, isn't that an incredible story? It, it still gives me goosebumps. It, it's a pretty amazing story. Today, the fifth kingdom principle that we must act on is illustrated in this story of the friends working hard to bring their friend to Jesus. These guys were successful for a few reasons, but specifically because they dared to do something different. Uh, the principle here is kingdom innovation. This is having the kingdom mindset of knowing that God is always doing something new, and we must continue to innovate in order to keep up with the Holy Spirit and His kingdom. At, at Connect, we, we like this because we've done some stuff differently and been innovative for over 15 years. We're always doing something different. We're always trying something new. We're always changing things up. Even what we're doing here today in this message we've never done before. Making pierogies in order to show love? But why not? Notice what happened in, in today's story. Luke 15, 9, or 5, sorry, 19 says, When they couldn't find a way in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof, removed some tile, and, and let him down right in the middle of everyone, right in front of Jesus. Just... Imagine the, the noise and the mess that these guys made. Here's Jesus speaking. The Son of God is speaking to a packed out audience. And all of a sudden, they hear this noise overhead. Then the, the plaster and the thatch starts falling down. And, and they're going, what is going on up there? It's, it's clearly interrupting, clearly inconvenient. All of a sudden, there's a little hole. And, and a guy's peeping through the hole. And he goes, oh, no, we need to move it this way. And they start tearing the roof off moving towards Jesus, making the hole bigger. They don't have a, they don't have a sawzall with them, a reciprocating saw with them. They're, they're tearing thing, this thing apart by hand, pulling off the tiles, making things up as they go along. Stuff is falling down. These guys are not only destroying somebody's roof, who they don't know, they're ignoring the needs and, and the preferences of the many in order to bring the one to Jesus. They had to be different and innovative. They were doing whatever it took to get this guy to Jesus. See, people are always more important than buildings. Connect is not about buildings. A church is people. Buildings are just tools to be used to bring people to Jesus. Buildings are worthless compared to a single soul. We sacrifice and we give to, to pay for a few leased spaces, but they're just tools. Your home is a kingdom tool as well. Uh, FaceTime and phones and apps are all just tools we have to do a kingdom work. Use them in this season to innovate for the kingdom. This guy's friends, they, they dared to do something creative, something new, something radical. My question for you is, have you ever gone the roof through, have you ever gone through the roof for anybody? You might say, well, that's a little extreme. And I would say that it was. But sometimes it takes extreme faith to reach some people for Jesus. What are you doing in this season to show extreme love for someone? See, some, some people aren't going to be won by weak faith. Maybe it's going to take extreme measures, extreme faith, 
exercised in extreme ways to get your friend to Jesus because he or she is just so paralyzed. Notice what the Bible says. Let's see how inventive we can be in encouraging love and helping out. Hebrews 10, 24. Or the NLT version of that says, think of ways to encourage one another to outbursts of love and good works. In other words, think of innovative ways. Be creative. Think it through. Have a, have a brainstorming session together in your group on how you will show radical love to others. Sure, we have limitations in this season, but lack always breeds creativity. And if you truly have compassion for others, it will always drive you towards innovation. There are many examples of innovation in the Bible. Uh, Matthew, one of the disciples, was a tax collector. When he came to Christ, he had a party for tax collectors and then invited Jesus to come. I, I heard of one group a while back uh, where they were having this thing called Master Wing Theater. Uh, once, once a month, they do up hot wings and then put on a martial arts movie and invite non-Christians to watch online with them. See, all it takes is just a bit of creativity. There's a limitless number of things you can do. There, there's enough creativity in your group to think up a thousand ways that you could act in love towards others. Forget COVID restrictions and instead look for opportunities. Did you know that there are whole groups at Connect who have never been in the same room together because of COVID, but have become so loving and connective and innovative that they're growing monthly? Innovate. The Bible says this, make the most of your chances to tell others the good news. Be wise in all your contacts with them, Colossians 4, 5. This week in your group, I want to ask you to get innovative. And I want you to brainstorm a list of ways that you can actively work with, within the guidelines that we have to invest in pre-believers and then plan and keep each other accountable to go out and act on one or two of those ideas that you come up with. Now, the sixth kingdom key shown in our story is that they work together to get the job done. This is cooperation. This is the, the kingdom principle of cooperating. Now, now this is, is the power of not just sharing your own faith on your own, but having a group to do it. Luke 5, uh, 5.19 says they went up on the roof and they lowered the man on his mat through the ceiling into the middle of the crowd. My question is... How many people does it take to let a guy down on a blanket? Four. If you only have three, what happens? The guy falls off that one corner. It takes all four people. And if everybody doesn't hold up their part, he's going to fall off. He's going to get hurt. They had to cooperate together, each doing a part. Why? Because the load was too heavy for any one individual. And that's true in living a kingdom life as well. Some people are only going to come to faith through a group effort. They're, they're never going to come to Christ just with one person sharing, one person inviting. It's, it's by seeing a group of people love each other really well that they're going to come to faith. In fact, studies have shown that, that people come to Christ faster, quicker, when they do so in the context of a supportive group environment. In other words, when they see multiple believers living out the kingdom teachings of Jesus, they're far more likely to commit to Christ than when they just see one believer. When you go and share with somebody, you tell them about Christ, they might say, well, I mean, that guy's just a bit of a crackpot probably. But there's a powerful witness in groups loving God and loving others well. That's why inviting them to group is good. They see how you love one another. They, they, they look at the 8 to 16 of you and go, man, all of these people couldn't be idiots. They all couldn't be dumb. They all couldn't be kooks. Man, look at how they take care of each other. Look at how these folks love one another. They aren't normal, but normal wasn't very great to begin with. You have a privilege that, that some Christians do not have, a loving, committed community of people sharing life together. See, it, it, it takes a kingdom cooperation sometimes. In Mark's account of the story, it tells us that there are four guys who who let him down because it was crowded in the house. I almost wanted to call this message, Four of a Kind Beats a Full House. <laughs> All right, fine. Here are four ways that your group can be on mission together. First of all, maybe you need to start a new group within your own group. 
you've got 10 to 20 people in, in, in your one meeting time, we'll start another. If your group gets too big to, that, then people stop sharing. The quiet ones get overlooked. Start another group at another time. Sometimes you can break up and have all the women go in one time slot and all the guys go in another and you can talk about different things that week and then get back together the next week. There, there are all kinds of benefits to that. Secondly, you could sponsor another group by providing a couple of leaders for a season. You know, you, you kind of send out a couple of leaders. You, you loan them out to start a, a new group for the next six months and, and to disciple and, and raise up a new leader and then they'll come back to your group. Three, you can serve in another group and keep attending your own group. You, you love your group and you don't want to leave it. That's great. But you realize we need to reach out and keep multiplying. So you serve in another group and keep attending your own. I, I know multiple people doing that right now, where they're in multiple groups in order to make sure that this thing can, can continue to grow. Also, you could, you could send out people to birth a new group. The mark of a spiritual maturity is the ability to reproduce. When, when a person has the ability to reproduce, then they're physically mature. And the mark of spiritual maturity is the ability to reproduce as well. You'll know a disciple by their love and by their fruit. The vine's purpose in producing fruit is to multiply itself. Healthy things multiply. In our passage today, the, the group was compassionate. They, they were actively loving. They were determined. They prayed. They, they brought him to Jesus. They were innovative. But the last kingdom principle is also vital. See, they were willing to pay the cost of the roof. This is the kingdom principle of sacrifice. That uh, the, the kingdom inherently you have to be willing to sacrifice. Have you ever thought about who paid for the roof repair in this story? Obviously, you, you wouldn't just go in and tear up a total stranger's house and then not fix it. I, I think they said, we don't care what it costs. We will pay to repair this roof. Somebody paid for the roof. Here's the principle. There is always a cost to seeking first the kingdom of God. Always a cost in time and energy and money and sacrifice. And far too often, many people aren't willing to pay the sacrifice. I've hated not gathering in this season. I've been frustrated in following the guidelines to a T. I think it sucks. But do you know what our public stance on this is? What, it, what that public stance communicates to non-believers who are scared of COVID? That we love you enough to lay down our desires. We will sacrifice our religious observances to have a testimony to you. And to reach people in this season requires sacrifice. You need to get out of your comfort zone. Jesus said, I will make you fishers of men. Now, I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but when I go ice fishing, fish just don't automatically jump onto the ice for me. What I've learned is that my culture, air, is very different than the culture that they live in, water. I've learned that fish are not going to get into my culture. I have to get into theirs if I'm going to catch them. And I have to get the, the, the right food in front of their nose at the right time where they live. I've always been confused by the signs outside of churches that say something along the lines of, here we are, everybody welcome, come on in. It's kind of like yelling at the, the ice, uh, saying, fish, come on out of the hole, join me over here. Kind of like this Calvin and Hobbes cartoon that you're going to see right here. Here, fish! See, they're not going to do that. Somebody's got to go out and go fishing for them. In fact, it, it should look a lot more like this Calvin and Hobbes cartoon. Yeah, he got it right. That means getting out of your comfort zone. See, the average fisherman never ventures more than about 300 meters from a paved road because most people want to fish by convenience. But real fishermen, like my dad was, they will go to crazy extremes to catch a fish. Minus 40, dress warmer, you baby. If it means walking one kilometer or two kilometers across the ice to get to the fish, so be it. Boy, you got to warm up those maggots by putting them under your lip. Get her done. Sacrifice for the catch. Real fishermen, they'll do whatever it takes to get to where the fish are and get them what it is that they need. What kind of spiritual fishermen are you? Is it, it is human nature to want to reach people for Jesus, but it's also human nature to want others to do it for you. Or, or if you must, then only when it's convenient and the Holy Spirit sends the fish to you with a kind of a bow wrapped on them. 
But if you are a true follower of Jesus, you'll do what he did. It's not always going to be convenient for you to bring people to faith. You know the sad thing about this story that we're looking at of the paralyzed man? The Bible tells us that the guy who desperately needed salvation and forgiveness the most almost couldn't get in because the room was filled with religious people. They, they'd taken up all the spots, and, and he couldn't come to Christ. You know, we, right now we have a list of 10 to 20 people waiting for a group, and they don't fit in right now due to schedule or demographic or space. I've seen people walk away from this church because there was no room for them to connect in a group. Maybe you could help us by sacrificing a little. 1 Corinthians 9.12 says, We haven't used our rights. Instead, we would put up with anything in order to not hinder the good news of Christ in any way. Are you willing to do that in this season? Are you willing to put up with anything in order to not hinder the good news of Christ? As you consider how to seek first the kingdom of God, we must ask, what are you willing to sacrifice in order to bring people to Jesus? I do. I have to. So many of you do too. In fact, I want to pause here for a moment and express my appreciation for the long-term partners of this church. They have put up with all kinds of inconveniences and changes. I still can't believe how faithful your given, giving has been during all of this. As of last week, according to our fan, financial team, we've only seen four people stop their regular giving. In fact, in two of the last nine months, our giving increased, and we've seen seven new people begin to give. Connectors know sacrificial giving. This church was built on unselfish people. Uh, Connect is, is one of the largest churches in the Kootenays, not by accident. It takes unselfish people to grow a church. People who know how to lay down their needs for the needs of others. Connect's partners, man, you, you could have said when we had 100 people, ah, oh, we've got enough. I'm done serving. I'm done loving. Uh, a, a lot of you wouldn't even be watching right now if that was the case. There are some of you who may have been headed for hell, but because someone persevered, someone sacrificed, someone innovated, you accepted the gospel and you're headed for an eternity with God. That's so cool. Because someone understood kingdom sacrifice. They unselfishly shared their group. They, they, they shared their money. They shared their time. Why? Because people matter to God. We, we, we have built this church on unselfish people who are willing to pay the cost of the roof in order to love God. But here's my fear. My fear is that our church will become just a little too comfortable, that we maybe become a little too complacent, that we would have it all so nice and comfortable, just the way I like it, my group is just right the way it is, that we're no longer willing to innovate, no longer willing to sacrifice and follow the Holy Spirit into the new thing that he is doing today that we start forgetting the reason why we exist as a church. I love how William Temple said this, the church is the only society that exists for the benefit of the non-members. We do not exist for us. The, the church never has. Jesus said, I didn't come to be served, I came to serve. Some of you have been in a small group for a long time and you've developed some close friendships and that is so good. But you're not excited at all about sending anybody out or bringing anybody new in. You've got your, your little holy huddle. It's us four and no more. Us seven all the way to heaven. But God's not impressed with that. And he wants you to reach out. He wants you to stretch beyond your comfort zone. Folks, there are paralyzed people all around us. Thousands of them. 31,000 within 25 minutes drives. And statistically, half of them, half of them want to know about Jesus if someone would be willing to reach out to them. So the question is, will you? You have to cost, you have to count the cost of being a follower of Jesus. This has implication for our mission field locally. Will I spend all the money that God has given me on me? Or will I take a portion of my money and give it to further God's kingdom? Will, will, I, will I use what I have to equip people, to reach people? Or will I use all of my money to just redecorate or, or save? The Bible says use worldly wealth to make eternal friends in heaven, Luke 16. Only you can figure out what sacrifices God wants you to make, but he will ask you to make them if you're going to seek first the kingdom and be about bringing people to Jesus. Man, this is such an incredibly exciting time to be alive.
And you can either get on board and be a part of a history-making church, or you can sit on the sidelines and miss it. My question for you is this. Are you ready to go through the roof for Jesus? Do you think that these four guys ever figured in their wildest imagination that 2,000 years later, on the other side of the world, a group of Canadians, which they didn't even know of, which didn't even exist back then, would be sitting around talking about them? No, they had no idea. But here's the point of that. The greatest way to leave a legacy is follow what the Holy Spirit is doing today. Not what he did yesterday, but doing today what he wants in order to bring people to Jesus. You'll be remembered for that. The greatest way to, to leave a legacy is to live a kingdom life that does what Jesus did. Today, I, I just want to challenge you to make a, a new determination to work harder than ever before to bring people to Jesus. It's not our job to save people. That's Jesus' job. But it is our job to bring them to Jesus and let him save them. Bring them into your life so that they can meet Jesus by seeing what he's done in you personally. The Bible says God is building a home and he's using all of us, irrespective of how we got here, in what he is building. He's used the apostles and the prophets in the foundation. And now he's using you, fitting you brick by brick, stone by stone with Jesus Christ as the cornerstone. Ephesians 2, 19 to 22. God's home is in your heart. And he wants to use you to bring himself to others. But really, here's the bottom line. Will you do more than just learn about seeking the kingdom? Will you do something about it? You know, we have over 20 groups in our church right now. And if each one would just reach one over the next year, that would mean 20 new believers. Just think about that. Each one reach one. Just one. I want to challenge you to do that. Today, I want to, I want to pray. And I'm going to invite you to follow me in this prayer. And wherever it is that you are, I want you to say it aloud. Just say this, Father, I want you to use me. And I want you to use me and my group to bring someone to Jesus this year. Help us to be concerned about the people who don't know you yet. To have a, a kingdom compassion, Father. Help us to be consistent in praying for kingdom connections. We have faith. We believe that you can save anyone. We believe that no one is hopeless and no one is beyond the reach of your love, Father. Help us to make action plans to bring people to you. Help us to not get discouraged when people don't initially respond, but to persist. Help us to try new innovative approaches and be creative in our strategies. Help us to cooperate together as a group so that we can do more together and help us to be willing to do what is uncomfortable in order to reach others, to sacrifice as Jesus did, who paid a high price to save us. We're willing to pay the cost to reach others, the people that you died for, Jesus. Thank you for the privilege of serving you in this kingdom work. We know that, that this is an, an eternal investment. We ask you in faith that you equip us and challenge us and empower us to speak the good news to people, to reach people for you. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. I want to challenge you now. Hopefully in your group, uh, you've had an opportunity to begin discussing this. Maybe you've shared your list with your group. Maybe you've already begun to brainstorm ideas with your group. Dig into this thing together so that maybe 2,000 years from now, people will be talking about how innovative you were in order to reach people for Jesus. Thank you, Connect Church, for all that you do. You rock. Be blessed. Wow, well, I'm uh, pretty happy to be going with Ronnie, but shopping isn't exactly my favorite thing. So I, I follow one rule when it comes to shopping. Get in and get out as fast as possible. Yeah, that's why I'm going. I'm doing something horrible that I don't like doing but just to, to just to love the neighbors. Oh, yeah, sweet. yeah. Look at these beautiful sausages. You know what, we'll get some cheddar too, just to sauce it up. There we go.